Hi, I'm Tony McMahon and this is Jesus Christ, Man or Myth. Now, I'm not a Bible studies professor or an academic, but what I want to do is to relay to you as a layperson some of the fascinating and compelling arguments about the story of Jesus Christ. I come at this from an agnostic perspective, but many of you may be evangelical or you may be agnostic or you may be atheist. Um, you'll all be catered for, don't worry. So all I'm doing is really relaying to you, as I say, the arguments about Jesus Christ, particularly around whether or not he was a historical figure or a mythical construct. Today I want to take a good, long, close look at those pagan Roman sources that are often cited as proof that a historical Jesus actually existed. Now many mythicists counter this and say that these are not credible sources, they may even have been later forgeries. So let's take a look at some of the pagan Romans who seem to endorse the existence of Jesus Christ. We'll start with the figure of Pontius Pilate. Now you'll remember him. He is the Roman governor who condemns Jesus to crucifixion. And in the earliest gospel, what's recognised by most people as the earliest gospel, that is Mark, Pilate, Pilate comes across as a rather cold-hearted, remote figure who simply waves Jesus off to be crucified. But he sort of becomes a more warm-hearted figure as you go through the Gospels, eventually even being regarded as a saint by some Christians in the East. This is presumably as Christianity spread into Greco-Roman populations and demonising Pontius Pilate became, well, a slightly more uncomfortable approach to the subject. In fact, so rehabilitated is Pontius Pilate in the eyes of early Christians that according to an early Christian writer, Tertullian, writing in 197 AD, now this is nearly, what, 200 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, he claims that Pontius Pilate wrote to the Emperor Tiberius full of praise for Jesus about his miracles and goodly deeds. According to this account, the Emperor Tiberius was so moved by this missive from Pontius Pilate that he went to the Senate and demanded that Jesus Christ be included among the Olympian gods. One of the first people to mock this account from Tertullian was the British historian Edward Gibbon, who wrote the classic work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And writing 200 years ago, he made the point, the entirely legitimate point, that everybody knew that Tiberius as an emperor had no time for religion at all. Uh, he was also a spectacularly cruel and a moral person who spent his time in a kind of semi-permanent exile in Capri, indulging every decadence. Also, Gibbon said, you know, really the Senate would have defied Tiberius. Tiberius, who was renowned as ruling by terror through his Praetorian prefect Sejanus. And also, under the Emperor Tiberius, there was probably nothing that we would call a Christian church, uh, let alone a monolithic group of people identifying themselves as Christians. Plus, Tertullian is writing something like 160 years after the crucifixion. But this idea of the Emperor Tiberius being swayed by early Christians, remember he was the emperor at the time that Jesus uh, undertook his ministry and was crucified. It continues a lot in the early church. There's even a story of Mary Magdalene somehow wangling her way into a banquet hosted by Tiberius in Rome in his palace. And she presents him with an egg and says, Christ is risen. And Tiberius laughs at this. Uh, and she says, well, if, if it's a joke, um, then nothing will happen. But if it's true, the egg will turn red. And sure enough, of course, the egg turned red, leading to a tradition at Easter of painting eggs red. This rather implausible story ends with Tiberius telling Mary Magdalene that she can preach the gospel throughout the imperial household. We then have a story that spread around in the early Christian church that the emperor Domitian, uh, so this is at the end of the first century AD, had as guests in the palace 
the grandsons of Jesus's brother Jude and he asked them about Christianity and its beliefs. Now it was said in this story that Domitian feared Jesus in the same way that Herod had done. Nevertheless, once he heard about Christian beliefs, particularly about a, a heavenly realm far up above, he decided that Christians posed no threat to the empire and suspended all persecution. It's also said that uh, Domitian brought St John of Patmos from his island exile, where he wrote the book of Revelation. He brought him from that far off island to the city of Ephesus and for some inexplicable reason allowed him to live out his days in retirement. Now it would take until the early 4th century AD for Christianity to be made in effect the state religion of the Roman Empire under the Emperor Constantine. But there seemed to be a hankering, a need for Romans to show that Christianity had permeated the elite of the empire a lot earlier than that. So, for example, we have the niece of the aforementioned Domitian converting to Christianity, and she's unharmed while her uncle is emperor. After he dies, she's then martyred. Another high-profile convert to Christianity, allegedly, was the wife of Aulus Plautius, the general who invaded Britain under the Emperor Claudius. And we also have the Emperor Alexander Severus at the start of the 3rd century AD, ranking Jesus among the Olympian gods. Those emperors who were not sympathetic to Christianity or even outright hostile were depicted by early Christian writers as being especially dissolute, decadent and cruel and often coming to a deserved grisly end. Intriguingly, there are accounts by pagan Roman historians that seem to suggest the existence of Jesus. So we have accounts from Tacitus, Suetonius, Josephus and Cassius Dio. It's long been suspected, however, that some of these paragraphs in these Roman histories were inserted by later Christian scribes or, or monks, because you have to remember that before the printing press, the only way in which these histories and documents and books were transmitted down to us was by scribes, and scribes were not always impartial. Take, for example, the Roman historian Josephus. Now, he has an interesting backstory. He was a Jewish rebel involved in the first Jewish revolt against Roman rule. But when that revolt was defeated, Josephus became a turncoat. Uh, he basically betrayed his people and became a loyal servant of the Roman Empire. And as such, he decided to write a history of the Jewish people. In his history, there's a curious passage referred to as the Testimonium, where Josephus makes reference to Jesus Christ, calling him explicitly the Messiah and a man who carried out great teachings and deeds. Josephus then goes on to boldly state that Jesus was resurrected after three days and appeared to his disciples. But many people have questioned the testimonium in Josephus's history because we're being asked to believe that an Orthodox Jew would hail Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Furthermore, he was writing for the Romans and really he'd have been praising the seditionary who was crucified and who also blasphemously in Jewish eyes referred to himself as the Son of God. All of this really doesn't add up. To get round this, some Christian writers have suggested in the past that Josephus may have converted to Christianity, but this seems highly unlikely. And would the Romans really have sponsored a history of the Jewish people from a Christian so soon after Jesus had been crucified? And we don't hear about this passage in Josephus' history until over a hundred years after it was written. It's not even mentioned by a Christian writer called Oregon in the second century AD who talks about Josephus. And then we have the account by Tacitus, which states something you'll all have heard of, that Nero deliberately started a fire in Rome, which he then blamed on the Christian sect. This would obviously have been a huge deal, and yet Suetonius, who wrote the lives of the first 12 emperors, including Nero, and is a pretty gossipy historian, never mentions this story, 
doesn't mention the Christians as being to blame and some of the other stories attaching to them. There's a long tradition of claiming that some of the early Christians entered into philosophical correspondence with some of the great pagan Roman thinkers. I have to say I think this is, uh, this is possibly evidence of a kind of intellectual inferiority complex on the part of early Greco-Roman Christian converts. But nevertheless, we have the story that um, Philo of Alexandria, a well-known Jewish philosopher, went to Rome, met St. Peter and entered into a friendship and correspondence with him. We have also the even more implausible idea that Seneca, an advisor to the Emperor Nero, was exchanging letters with St. Paul. Nevertheless, those letters are there. They can be read today. Personally, I don't find them very convincing. Given what Nero is alleged by Tacitus to have done to the Christians later on, uh, it's a little confusing that we have Paul writing to Seneca saying that he's heard that Nero quite likes the Christians and is open to their ideas. Well, not sufficiently enough, as it turned out according to Tacitus. So what are we to make of these questionable pagan Roman accounts of the life of Jesus. I think what it does show is that many early Christians, particularly from a Greco-Roman background as opposed to a Jewish background, felt a need to show their neighbours, their families, those they were trying to convert, that Christianity had been accepted by Roman scholars and Roman officials at the time of Jesus' life or shortly after. They, they needed that comfort. They needed that assurance. You even see that in the writings of St. Augustine, in particular in his huge book, City of God. Because what could be worse than to tell potential Greco-Roman converts that at the time, Jesus Christ, this Galilean in the uh, easternmost part of the Roman Empire, was basically unknown in Rome, unknown among elite opinion and unknown to the great Roman thinkers and philosophers. It was far more attractive to portray Jesus as a philosopher, almost in the Greek and Roman tradition, unfairly put to death by a mob, with Pontius Pilate as an enlightened governor imploring the mob to spare his life. That's a nice picture of Jesus. Unfortunately, the reality is more likely that he was an apocalyptic preacher executed as a seditionary by the Romans and unknown to the Roman elite. But with regards to those pagan Roman sources, what do we make of them? Well, you either accept that all those references to Jesus are forgeries, or as some have tried to argue, that it's a mixture of forgery and truth, that some of the lines are true and others are false, or that it's all true and that the Romans knew about Jesus and wrote about him at the time. Well, if you've got any views, do get in touch. I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I hope you are too. Tell me what you think. Tell me whether you think Tacitus, Suetonius, Josephus, Cassius Dio really had heard of Jesus. Tell me what you think about Pontius Pilate. Was he a cruel, cold governor or was he sympathetic to the Christian cause? I'm Tony McMahon and I look forward to seeing you again. Thanks and goodbye.